This was a fairly significant week in the education beat with the uh, release of the Cozen O'Connor report, the investigation of the school districts and um, handling of the October 2016 sexual assault. Um, and also the school board was meeting in closed session to review the performances of Superintendent Max McGee, um, Pali Principal Kim Diorio and other Pali administrators. Um, so you were pretty busy, <laughs> Elena. There was the um, uh, meeting on Wednesday in closed session where it was unclear what the result of that might be um, as far as Max McGee's tenure with the district. Give us a little bit of an idea of, of where that brings us up to mm -hmm. um, in terms of the board's examination of his performance. Right. So after the closed session, um, Terry Godfrey came out and said they took no reportable action. Mm -hmm. um, they were in there for four hours. This is the, I don't remember what they met multiple times last week in closed session also to discuss um, McGee's performance. Mm -hmm. um, so it's unclear if this is a continuing conversation that might keep going on in the coming weeks, um, but there wasn't any definitive action taken that they reported this week on his uh, future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if they had made a decision that was that was announceable, uh, they certainly were obligated to do it as they came out of the meeting. Right, and, even, and based on our review of the Brown Act beforehand, even mm -hmm. if they had taken a vote that uh, didn't pass, so you know if it had been like two to three instead of three to two, they would have had to report that regardless. So it wasn't mm -hmm. just a affirmative action that passed that they would report. So Okay. So it's possible something's going on behind the scenes that is very continue, possible. <laughs> continuing on. Yeah. Okay. And I, th I think it's likely, given the way trustees Todd Collins and Ken Dauber announced their views on this ahead of time, I think it's likely that before this process comes to a close, they would force a vote, I'm guessing, because mm -hmm. I think they would want there to be a vote, even if they lost that vote. Mm -hmm. So I think probably we can read into this that this process is continuing and that it's not yet reached a point of decision. Yeah, yeah. And no uh, next meeting has been announced yet as far as another closed session. Not yet. Uh, the board is having a regular meeting on Tuesday. They haven't, um, I haven't seen the closed session agenda items yet, so I, that could be next week. I'm not sure. They are discussing in open session next week um, the search process for a new superintendent since McGee is retiring at the end, of, or he has said he's retiring at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Also, it's probably worth pointing out that when the board meets in a special meeting rather than a regular meeting, they mm -hmm. only have to provide 24 hours notice. So ah. it's fairly easy for them, if they wish, to schedule mm -hmm. a closed session just for the purposes of continuing this discussion, and, and we that could happen, you know, on a day's notice. Sure. So it could be happening on Monday or Saturday or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's still TBD. Mm -hmm. um, they were looking also at other administrators in the same closed session. Is that correct? Or yeah, I mean, they don't name administrators on the agenda item that's mm -hmm. marked, but it was for superintendent, high school principal, and a high school assistant principal. So I think we can assume based on what's been going on, this was mm -hmm. um, the Pali administration's role in this uh, sexual assault report that happened last year, which was really examined in depth the next day, th um, yesterday, um, mm -hmm. in an open session meeting, which was really striking. We were just discussing beforehand, perhaps the first public presentation of this kind where, you know, specific administrators were named and it was explained exactly how they acted or didn't act in a really yeah. um, controversial case. Yeah. I, I just want to add before we go further on your question, mm -hmm. technically the board only supervises one person and that's the superintendent. Ah. Mm -hmm. So it's a little, um, I think, confusing mm -hmm. that the evaluation of other people shows up on their closed session agenda. Mm -hmm. They can have a discussion about the performance of those folks, mm -hmm. but any action would not be board action. Mm -hmm. It would be action by the superintendent. And that kind of action, so, you know, discipline, would that, that wouldn't be required for them to announce? No, because I, I think the nature of that would be a discussion that was yeah. urging the superintendent to mm -hmm. do a certain thing mm -hmm. because they cannot direct him to do things that would involve administrative matters under his yes. direct responsibility. Go beyond their purview. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Good point. Um, so let's talk about the Cozen O'Connor report. Now, the board had seen this report last week. Mm -hmm. They got a copy there. And this follows 
quite a bit of community uproar when um, it was made public by a TV station that there was a sexual assault um, report. In, report in the campus bathroom. Um, it involved a male student who was also um, under investigation later um, found uh, responsible for another assault of a MA student. Um, so the so the board has has been exposed to the details both before in May mm -hmm. and then also last week in the Cozen O'Connor report. What did you see from the uh, trustees this week as far as their um, their response to the report publicly? Is it different than in May? Are they more concerned about any specifics? What's what was their? I will say they didn't have a huge amount of time to comment last night. It was only a two-hour meeting, mm -hmm. and the Cozen lawyers. Um, gave a, a quality presentation, but took up almost, I think, an hour. Um, and then there was public comment, um, which also they tested out their first, cutting it down to one minute per person if there's more than 20 people. So yeah, it was kind of quick pilot. comments. Mm -hmm. um, I think the difference between now and May is now that they, they have this objective uh, presentation of what actually happened in May. I think there was all this uproar and reaction, and they wanted to avoid being mm -hmm. reactive without having all the facts. Mm -hmm. But I think that a lot of what we reported um, at the time and what and what was sort of found out publicly aligns with what's in the report. There's just more detail and the names are attached. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's and it's very clear, you know, how the the timeline of things going up the chain of command and then sort of falling apart after that. Yeah. yeah so um, so there were a number of people who were named not in the report, but mm -hmm. um, by the attorneys at the meeting. yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, there were some people who came out looking like heroes, quite honestly. You know who did the right thing yeah. in a very timely manner. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about those people real quick. Sure. Yeah. So the initial two staff members, not administrators, who dealt with the, the female student who reported it, an instructional aide who seems to be the very first person that she told, mm -hmm. um, immediately brought her to the wellness center, um, where a the mental health coordinator, who's also just a counselor who sees students at the wellness center, talked with her. Mm -hmm. He immediately um, told an assistant principal, Vicki Kim told the school resource officer, which um, who works for the police department, mm -hmm. and he also filed, uh, as a mandated reporter, filed a report with Child Protective Services. Mm -hmm. um, and that, and the Cozen lawyer said, you know, that immediate response was sort of the textbook way things should happen. Mm -hmm. um, the counselor also took notes contemporaneously. Yeah, he took notes, they said, notes. from like 2 p.m. until 8 p.m. that night, you know, detailed notes about what he did, the information received, and everything was going on. Mm -hmm. um, and then the assistant principals, I think everything did kind of continue going up the chain. Vicki Kim mm -hmm. um, told Kim DiOrio. Kim DiOrio told Max McGee. Mm -hmm. um, Kim also told Holly Wade, who's the Title IX coordinator at the time. Yeah. Um, and that all happened within hours. Yes, yeah. within the regular, I mean, the time periods that required, which right. is in, I think, 24 hours. Right. Um, so a lot happened the very first day, and that the immediate response mm -hmm. was sort of, it happened the way it should. Mm -hmm. um, Vicki Kim also, interestingly, this was new at the meeting, um, the lawyer said that she, three separate times, both when this when this first happened um, and twice later over the coming months, um, asked Holly Wade, do we need to offer this student a uniform complaint procedure, which they are required to do mm -hmm. um, under policy and law. Um, at, at the very start, Wade said no, apparently. Um, again, at a training with a district law firm, Dora Dome, mm -hmm. Vicki Kim again asked, said, you know, and this was about two months later, it sounded like, okay. um, this is this was what happened. Should we have offered USP at the time? The lawyer again said no. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the semester, when the female student was communicated that she was going to leave Pali because of the impact of this incident, mm -hmm. Vicki Kim again went to Wade and said, at this point, should we offer her and her family USP? And she was again told no. Um, so she was persistent. You can tell that there was this disagreement within internally within the district yeah. over what should be done. Yeah. And so, again, I mean, there was really a lot of um, fault placed with, with Holly Wade for being, and she was the Title IX coordinator at the time, so she's the person who owns these obligations at the district level. Yeah. Can we just uh, take a break and um, talk about the UCP? What is the uniform, mm -hmm. uniform complaint procedure? Because I'm not sure that everyone knows I know. <laughs> where it came from or, or what it is exactly. So it's this a separate process that was set up to handle um, allegations of discrimination that could be gender-based discrimination, like sexual violence, bullying, race-based discrimination. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's like it's bullying based on a protective, protected class, which can be gender or disability. Yeah. 
Um, so when bullying happens at school, it's just based on, you know, kids being mean to each other or based on like someone's size. Um, mm. There's not a UCP process, but if it's something more serious based on a protective class, there's this district level process that's supposed to handle it. Um, and that's where a lot of um, things have gone wrong in the district in recent years, not only with sec Title IX issues, but also bullying. Um, there's another really uh, interesting um, finding um, by Cozen and O'Connor, and that is uh, in terms of record keeping, that it's m mandatory to be keeping notes as the counselor had um, and compiling all the information about a case, keeping it in a central location. Um, so that didn't seem to happen, uh, first of all. <laughs> And then second of all, it seemed that there was some directive even uh, to staff that there shouldn't be um, emails sent regarding um, these kinds of matters. What exactly was the genesis of that, that directive and, and how was it practiced? Based on what the lawyers said at the meeting yesterday, this was a long-standing practice in the district that came from district administrators, they said, including the Wade and previous people in her position. Um, and it sounded like it, it came from the district and then was perpetuated at Pali as seen in this case um, mm -hmm. with staff members. They said did keep notes of not contemporaneously and didn't, they didn't share them in the right way, but they were on their phones or they dictated notes to themselves in ways that couldn't be um, released under a Public Records Act request. Mm -hmm. um, that's I think what we don't know yeah. is is what the thinking was behind that. Mm -hmm. um, the Kozner lawyers indicated that um, common practice in civil litigation and common advice by civil litigation attorneys uh, historically has often emphasized to their clients, don't keep extemporaneous notes that only come back to haunt you. Um, and Yet an, there's another school of thought, which I think is more prevalent today and a, a sort of a more thoughtful approach, which mm -hmm. is by all means, when you're dealing with issues of compliance and the welfare of kids and a mm -hmm. investigative um, timeline and so on, that that's precisely when you need to keep the most detailed notes and mm -hmm. centralize those notes and make sure that you're you're building a file that contains the full picture of what's happened. Mm -hmm. And so we, this all came to light uh, in a very brief mention in the report. The board members attempted to zero in a little bit more at yeah. the meeting last night, but the response was fairly uh, vague and mm -hmm. the Kozner attorneys may not have been able to drill down and find out the origin of that. but. You know, it's it's entirely possible that the district received legal advice from one of its law firms that, mm -hmm. hey, better to not write anything down, mm -hmm. and that the administrators, uh, recognizing that they might have to refresh their memory about these things, were using all these other devices to mm -hmm. to kind of keep track of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that's a kind of cutting edge issue in terms of what's. Uh uh, under the Public Records Act, because I know uh, last year there was a state uh, Supreme Court uh, uh, examination of uh, public mm -hmm. email accounts versus private email accounts. I'm actually a little bit surprised that things that are on people's phones aren't um, subject to to that kind of. Search. They are now. They are now. They are now. Yeah. yeah, but but I think I think what you've got is a mentality that has settled in. Mm -hmm. It was described as a systemic, you know, issue or mm -hmm. a cultural issue, um, where there is basically a fear on the part of administrators that, wow, if I do something wrong, it might wind up in the local newspaper because the district has turned it over in response to a public records act request. Mm -hmm. And and for the benefit of our viewers, the we make records requests all the time as do other news organizations and. More times than not, the response that we get from those contains uh, redactions and uh, limitations that prevents any uh, identifiable student information from coming through. So right. this, mm -hmm. this is an unplaced fear if mm -hmm. it's about the release of student information. 
And beyond that, I just think there's a general, the culture is one of, of not wanting this stuff to get out either to the board or to the public, mm -hmm. which is a shame. And I think it's part of what needs to, to change. Yeah. Was it clear, Elena, um, who was perpetuating the, um, the practice at Pali? It wasn't totally clear. I mean, it said, mm -hmm. the, or the lawyer said that it came from prior district level employees, um, but obviously there was evidence of Pali staff members sort of following that. Um, mm -hmm. But it's unclear if, you know, Kim Diorio purpose or, you know, explicitly she told, told her staff that, or, that was kind of unclear. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there are certain members of the community that are misinterpreting what the Cozen attorneys said on this subject. And I think it's mm -hmm. important that it's best we can to clear that up because mm -hmm. I think it was fr from our knowledge of the way district meetings work. I think they were clearly referring to meetings of all the principles that take place periodically with the superintendent and other senior district administrators. Mm -hmm. The reference to meetings of principals didn't refer, we believe, to mm -hmm. meetings at Pali of the assistant principals. Mm -hmm. That's, so this, is, mm -hmm. this policy was not directed at or created by Pali. Right. This was a district-wide yeah. philosophy that we don't know the origin of it, but mm -hmm. it was definitely coming from the district. And um, Cozen O'Connor had very, very harsh criticism of Holly Wade. I mean, they just kept repeating in their report, she was supposed to do this, she, she did not, or she was, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot, was, a lot of blame was placed on her. They almost made it seem like she was MIA, kind of in terms of her responsibilities. Was there anything that they cited that she did correctly within this whole process of responding to the sexual assault? Mm. I mean, she was involved in the initial conversations mm -hmm. around it. You know, she communicated with the Pali staff about it. But mm -hmm. uh, beyond that, I mean, I, th I think she, she failed in her responsibilities as Title IX yeah. coordinator. It makes us, that pretty clear. Yeah. Um, I, think, I, I think I don't remember anything in the report that said this was done correctly mm -hmm. in terms of her duties. I think the impression that you get from this report and from the lawyer's commentary yesterday was that um, either by design or just because this is the way Holly Wade liked to work, that there was a pushing off to site administrators mm -hmm. responsibility. And that, I think, led to the site administrators feeling somewhat abandoned mm -hmm. and without a lot of guidance and having to go with their instincts and the trainings that they had had. So yeah. you get the feeling of what what the Kozner lawyers would like to see happening is mm -hmm. much more centralized uh, direction and control, mm -hmm. that it's the district's responsibility um, once they have a report from a school site mm -hmm. to conduct these investigations. It's not for the district to say back to the school, well, do what needs to be done. Yeah, you know? yeah. And that's also always been some of the issues with the UCP process and the mm -hmm. two-tiered issue of, you know, what happens at the site level and what happens yeah. in the district and mm -hmm. things getting all muddled in between and, you know, things that should be risen to the district level um, staying at the site and that being really problematic for mm -hmm. the students involved. Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, one of the assistant principals, Kathy Lawrence, now Gunn High School mm -hmm. principal, was called out in the report as well as yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, for, for not taking the information that she had received uh, about the bullying of this same female student and sharing that with anybody. Yeah. One could imagine that, that if she had thought this needs to go up, you know, up the chain of command, then mm -hmm. it would have come down and, and people would have been informed. Yeah. Um, but again, I mean, kind of a re reflection of a sort of a fractured system right. um, yeah. that was in place. What is uh, Max McGee's uh, take on all of this? What did he say yesterday? He, um, you know, he, he, he said, I make no excuses. You know, he didn't um, try to sort of explain away what happened mm -hmm. um, and, you know, noted all the things that have been put into place in the recent months, mm -hmm. um, which the cousin lawyers also did. You know, there have been significant changes since all this came out. Mm -hmm. um, they're hoping to hire, hire a full-time Title IX coordinator instead of having, you know, administrator who has other duties also be the Title IX coordinator. Mm -hmm. um, they're trying to make reporting easier for students with an anonymous 
um, complaint option online. Mm -hmm. So he threw, I mean, unsurprisingly went through sort of things that they've done in response, um, but did acknowledge, you know, things that there's a lot more that needs to be done. Yeah, the staff went through specific training this summer that was much more in-depth, it sounds like. Yes, and that was another interesting obvious. thing in the meeting. Um, a, a staff member from Pali, um, actually Dario's assistant, Carolyn Benfield, um, went up to the podium and said, I just wanted everyone to know that administrators received no training before May 2017. Hmm. And that was really shocking to hear. On so, Title IX. On Title IX, yeah. <laughs> so, and board members, I think Todd Collins said, What's that about? Um, mm -hmm. Were we aware that of this? That got a rise out of the board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was just kind of mm -hmm. shocking to hear. And then Mac and Max's answer to Todd, he said something like, well, let me put it this way. I hadn't received any training before May. So I spoke with Max after mm -hmm. the meeting, um, and he said that everyone had received, you know, there's generic sexual harassment training that everyone in the district has to go through. Mm -hmm. They had done that um, on a regular basis, but specific Title IX training on what to do when a report comes in, how you conduct an hmm. investigation, even just the terms which people who know Title IX are familiar with, like complainant and respondent, he said they hadn't been aware of that or been using those terms yeah. until May, which is after all this came out. Mm -hmm. um, so and when not this, only this, but several other cases prior. Right. Yeah. So when this happened months before, um, and the staff members at Pali hadn't mm -hmm. apparently had this you know, specific training on Title IX. Yeah, and I, I want to make sure that we don't interpret that to mean there weren't substantial trainings. There have been trainings that have been instigated and conducted dating all the way back to the 2013 Terman bullying case as a result of OCR's requirements. So there have been substantial amounts of training. Now, whether it's been effective or not and whether it is been labeled Title IX um, training, uh, we don't have any real way of knowing that. But I think mm -hmm. that that a false impression was initially created at the meeting yesterday that, oh my God, you're kidding us. No training took place of school administrators until last spring on any of these issues. That's just not the case. There's mm -hmm. been lots of trainings. I don't think training failures is the problem yeah. here. Implementation failures. It's It's... It's, I think the, the, the trainings can only go so far, and I think yeah. it, was, it was pointed out, there needs to be kind of practices of, of sure. different situations mm -hmm. and how to respond. But I think that one can't really expect, the, the, the expectation of, a, of an administrator or a teacher should be to recognize when there's a triggering event that requires action under policies, law, procedures. And at that point, they should not be the primary ones deciding how to carry out all those things. That's why you have a district staff. That's why you have um, a town line coordinator who's really a mm -hmm. compliance officer is mm -hmm. what that yeah. position really is. It's way broader than Title IX. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that um, it's neither a case of inadequate training uh, nor, um, well, let's just say that I think that, that the the staff is equipped with enough knowledge, as they demonstrated in this particular case, mm -hmm. to notify the district, the responsible district staff members. And at that point, the burden kind of shifts to those district staff members to make sure that all the necessary things occur. And bottom line, this isn't this is being portrayed as rocket science, and it's really not. Mm -hmm. uh, with all of these policies, it can easily be kind of obscured as to, what really needs to happen. But the bottom line really is, like in any organization, when, when certain things happen, you need to conduct an investigation. You need to interview witnesses. You need to write a report. You need to come to a, a conclusion. You need to make findings as to whether on the preponderance of the evidence mm -hmm. something happened this way or something happened the other way. Mm -hmm. And if you just do that, you don't have all these problems. It all starts with how that investigation is done. And it doesn't need to be an investigation done by some high-powered outside attorney. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, corporations do this all the time when they get a report of some issue within the organization. Well, McCose and Lawyers said that, and Jennifer DeBranza asked, you know, what are we missing here? Because we, we've had the training, we have the policies, so how do we get to that point? And um, Gina Smith just she was talking about, you know, districts or 
colleges that just have a Google Doc or an Excel spreadsheet, which seems pretty simple of something that people can share in real time so everyone has access to the information and it goes to the right people up the chain of command. Um, so it, it, like you said, it's not rocket science. It's just having that structure. Well, and the place. irony is that, that there is a structure that exists already called Infinite Campus, mm -hmm. which is a district-wide computer system available to administrators and teachers. And it's, it, it is where they log in everything that occurs, every incident that happens on a school campus. They're required to log into Infinite Campus. And in past reporting efforts over the years, we've tapped into that information with the help of district officials, and there seems to be a real lack of awareness on the part of the, the senior level folks, including the board, as to the resources that already exist. We don't need to redesign the whole mm -hmm. thing. We just need to make sure that there's accountability. Mm -hmm. here. Well, it does seem like the uh, trustees were fairly exasperated um, that not only this case, but going back several years that the district's been working on um, compliance for quite a while, and yet, you know, here's yet another uh, example. Um, so uh, where do we stand now, then, as far as what, what happens now? The report's <laughs> out, the board's looked at it. So Cozen O'Connor is still doing work in the district there. Actually, they were already... Before this uh, report came out in May, they were working with the district on mm -hmm. their OCR resolution agreement. So they have said, as they're continuing that work, at their point, they're going to issue recommendations. Um, they're also investigating other cases, I guess not at this level of depth, but um, yeah. they've been asked to look into other um, incidents of, of reported sexual violence, and at least one at Pali that, that we're aware of. Um, so there could be more from them. Um, mm -hmm. There weren't any sort of like action items the board gave in terms of this is what the report said now go do this yeah. um, but they said no now that we have this in hand we need to sort of move forward on all these issues so um, I'm sure there will be more it's sort of unclear exactly what the next steps and the, the, the investigations that you reference as, as them still needing to do are still in the yeah. process of most of those have been required by OCR right. yeah, and what they what they really are are it, OCR wants to make this district do the investigations that they should have done on Phil Winston, former Pali principal, on uh, Kevin Sharp, mm -hmm. former Pali English teacher, on Ronnie Farrell, former Pali science, science teacher. teacher, all of whom have left uh, as a result of conclusions reached about their behavior in regards to sexual harassment. In none of those cases did the district do a proper investigation. Mm -hmm. And there are other cases as well. So, you know, we're going to get, the district is going to get some practice on doing this because they're being forced to. Mm -hmm. And let's hope that one of the outcomes of that is, is a new philosophy about how those investigations should, should mm -hmm. take place. Mm -hmm. And to clarify, the investigations will be conducted by whom? By the Kozner, uh, the Kozner, Kozner 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 yes. Okay. Yeah, under the resolution agreement, the district mm -hmm. had to get an independent person, yeah, investigator oh, to redo these investigations, and yeah. Kozen is who is doing that. We'll hear more from Kozen then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and a, and a Kozen uh, attorney is currently the interim Holly Wade, the right, interim sure. Title IX coordinator. Not the two that did this report, but another person from the Right, yeah. who is... Interim and on his way out, if if and when the district can get that position mm -hmm. hired. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for the discussion and clearing up. I, I just want to before we yeah. wrap up here. I just want to uh, make the observation. We didn't talk at all about the teachers and the, some students mm -hmm. turning out at the board meeting sure. yesterday. Mm -hmm. I think we had to spend a couple minutes talking about that because mm -hmm. I think there's. Um, and you've had some teachers reach out to you, interested in potentially talking about their views towards uh, Kim Diorio mm -hmm. and the other staff there. There's clearly a lot of frustration, anger, tension that exists now between administrators and teachers and some parents at Palo Alto High School that... Um, needs to get worked through in some manner mm -hmm. and the parent there are parents that are that are uh, deeply committed to seeing Kim Diorio fired mm -hmm. um, and they're pressing that 
case wherever they can. And they're, of course, utilizing, as they would be expected to, this report to push that, that um, agenda. Uh, that's given rise to this, this sort of defensive response mm -hmm. that the teachers have kind of organized. Um, can, can you talk any further about what your observations were from yesterday as to mm -hmm. what was said by those teachers? And well, yeah, so the majority of public comment, I sort of expected yesterday to be, yesterday to be like a, unfortunately, like a pitchforks kind of yeah. <laughs> meeting, yeah. um, but the majority of public comment was all, almost all teachers, a few students um, from Pali really defending Kim. Um, Clearly anticipating a potential yes. action to terminate. Yeah, her. and there are many more um, teachers in the audience as well who didn't speak. Mm -hmm. um, it was like, you know, the room was full. Um, and most, all of them referenced um, her cutting down on streaking at Pali and that really changing the culture there. Um, obviously, you know, after mm -hmm. Winston left, she stepped in, um, you know, and just describing her as, you know, the best longtime teachers who had been worked with other principals, you know, she's the best leader they've had there. Um, and obviously, you know, stepping up to say, if, if you take her away, it's gonna be really detrimental for Pally. Um, so nothing really specifically addressed her handling of this case or what was said in the report, but just defending her record as, you know, the leader of the school. Yeah, and I think that, that from our previous reporting, we have kind of a long view of all this because mm -hmm. we've been reporting on this since the the sort of issue of sexual harassment first kind of um, surfaced mm -hmm. with the publication in 2013 of the Verdi article. Um, but I think it's important for the community and our viewers to understand that we now know that it was Kim Diorio who um, brought concerns about Phil Winston to the district uh, a week or so prior to his being, uh, to his resignation, mm -hmm. uh, and that she's um, been harshly criticized by some who have looked at all this data for not coming earlier, and the OCR in its report in March emphasized that as well, that there were signs of concern, reports of concern that that uh, were well, that predated her June uh, reporting of all this. And mm -hmm. uh, and so that's, that's an issue that continues to be raised. Mm -hmm. But I also think it's important for the, the, our viewers to understand that in the case that it was her reports that actually busted open the whole issue of Phil Winston's mm -hmm. behavior and led to his ultimate termination. Yeah. And she very assertively was trying to get the district to take action to get Kevin Sharp out of the classroom for months prior to his actually being removed from the classroom. Uh, there's lots of evidence where she was pleading with Associate Superintendent um, Scott, Bowers. Scott Bowers, HR person, to get him out of the classroom to no avail. So I think that this, this issue of Diorio's performance is a is a a very difficult one mm -hmm. to get a handle on, and I think that that may be actually the most difficult challenge for the board and mm -hmm. for the superintendent is to actually how to deal with that, um, the pluses and minuses of how she's performed. Uh, over the last three years. Right. There's the actions taken, but then there's also the timing of those actions. And you see a lot of people talking about, well, so-and-so has good intentions or someone, someone's a human being. And, you know, how many of us would mm -hmm. um, would know what to do immediately? Um, and those, all those things need to be weighed in. in yeah. And her staff's response so. to this particular case, and this, on, this investigation only looked at this one case, but mm -hmm. at least with regards to this one case, I think the... Kozner conclu the Kozen Kozen. <laughs> conclusions uh, were that the initial sort of on the ground response to this was just what it should be. Mm -hmm. It was focused on the safety of the kids involved, mm -hmm. um, and that where the where the ball really got dropped here was once knowledge flowed to the district about it. Yeah, I think there's no question that the administration seemed to know what to do in the in the immediate, mm -hmm. you know, instance of a report being made and how, 
they're focused mostly on just taking care of the kids and, and making sure in the bullying situation that mm -hmm. those people who are bullying were, were, were admonished. Um, but then it just seems to get kind of nebulous with the Title IX issue yeah. um, and the procedures and, and how to follow along. Yeah. And such. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, I think we'll wrap it up for this week. Um, that's, uh, that's it for this week, and you can always follow us on uh, paloaltoonline.com for more of Elena's reporting on this and other issues. Uh, follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, and if you like this video and want to see more, subscribe below. We'll see you next week.